Amen. That is who He is. And guys, I'm just, I'm so thankful. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful for the anointing on our worship team. And I don't, I don't just mean in the skill area. I mean, obviously we have some very talented musicians, but um, just in the way that they, they seek the Lord week after week and prayerfully consider the songs, not just, hey guys, what are we, what are we good at? Let's do this one. But I know that Grace and Victor every week seek the Lord and ask Him how the Spirit will move through this worship time. And I'm just so grateful for that. So guys, thank you for all that you put into that. Thank you for following the Lord's leading in it. We have got a lot to celebrate. We came off of a very celebratory ending to our service last week, and you guys can go have a, have a seat. But it has been an exciting week. Um, got Michael home from the hospital, so again, welcome back, Michael. And then we got to welcome in two new RISE family members on Wednesday. Gabby and Andrew welcomed their baby girl, and then Erica and Elliot welcomed a baby boy on Friday. Yeah. Woo! So we are excited to meet them. And Gabby was so cute. She, she, had, she had such an amazing delivery that she was home the same day. And it was like so seamless that she forgot to mention it. And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I had a baby too. And we were just, we were dying because it was, it was just such an awesome answer to prayer that everything went so smoothly and their, their families connecting up um, just, just very naturally. So it was just, just a really fun announcement that we got to hear and super excited for those families. Um, speaking of family fun... How many game players do we have in here? I'm not talking like video games, but board games. Barthels, I know. We, we've been talking about having a game night for years, so we need to get on that. But any other, any other game players? Ramey, I know your family. Mike has talked all about that. Yeah, so a couple game players in here. Um, we like to do family games, but with kids eight and under, you know, it's a little bit different. Um, how about Monopoly? Any Monopoly players? I feel like you either love Monopoly or you hate Monopoly because it's one of those games that if you do it right according to the rules, it can last many hours, if not many days. So this is a long game. And so a lot of times, um, I don't know if I've ever played a full full version of Monopoly, but a lot of times people will make house rules or go according to the short game. Um, and so they kind of modify it so it doesn't last forever. Um, and the men in my family like to play chess. And I'm not saying it's a man's game, but I'm, I'm saying that they're, eh, I don't want to put myself in a box here and say I'm not strategic, but they enjoy the mathematical strategy of it all. And I used to like it when I was younger, but I feel like the older I get, maybe I have like adult onset ADD or something because I don't like the games anymore where I have to wait a really long time for my turn. Can anybody relate to that? Like, like keep it moving, keep it exciting. If I space out on you, like the game is no longer fun. So um, about two years ago, Ezra um, learned from one of his cousins how to play chess. And so that's kind of been his thing lately. And I don't mind playing with him every now and again because he's kind of at this place where his level of strategy kind of meshes well with my attention span. You know, he's just like, I'm going to bust down my queen on the second move. And so I'm like, okay, well, this is going to be a fast game. Let's play again. Um, so it works out really well. Um, but another game that's really popular in our house right now is Candyland. And that's because everybody except for Charlotte can get down with some Candyland. We understand you draw the card, you go to the space that, you know, is that color, and it's, it's all golden, right? So Michael thought I should talk about chess, but, or not chess, I did talk about chess, about poker. But I've never played poker, um, and he actually comes from a long line of poker players, his, like, great-great-uncle or somebody... <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble with my in-laws. Sorry, guys. Um, but wrote a book on it because they were, like, such an expert. So I will let him talk about that in another sermon that will be equally, if not more, amazing. But for now, since I'm hanging with people eight and under, Candyland is my jam, okay? So how this kind of goes down in our house is I frequently get asked, um, usually now by our four-year-old, but can we play Candyland? So I'm like, okay, go ahead. And why don't you guys go ahead and get it set up, and then I'll be in when I'm done doing whatever. Um, so I come in and they've got it all set up. And usually this is how it goes. Um, you know, somebody, whoever set it up, is sitting there smiling. Now, I know what's happened behind the scenes. So I, I'm pretty wise to it anyway. Somebody has gone and they have stacked the deck. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. So for, for being these godly PKs, apparently I need more godly workers and rise kids because they've got some, they've got some schemes up their sleeves. Um, so... They like, to, they like to set it up, and they kind of watch me, and they're like, I'm going to win. But um, sometimes I let it kind of roll, and I'm just like, oh, my gosh, how did you, how did you end on, you know, like, the Frosty Queen on, like, move one, and now you're two moves away from winning? But other times, 
and this is kind of mean, but it's kind of awesome too. Um, I come in and I'll sit down and I'll be like, okay, did you shuffle it really good? And Abby's like, uh -huh. oh, I'm telling on who it is. Okay, well, they all do it. <laughs> but, but they all are like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's mixed up really good. It's, it's going to be great. And so I'll, I'll say, okay, well, let's just make sure it's extra good. And I mix up the deck. And I just watch as their little faces just like get this horrified expression. They're like, <gasps> because all of their plans have gone out the window. And I'm like, okay, now it's really good. You ready? And they're like, but sometimes they have strategized so much that they can't handle it and they like freak out before the game even begins. Like, no, you can't do that. I set it up how I wanted it. And they get so upset and I feel kind of bad. But, um, and sometimes they'll just completely bail out of the game before it even starts because they just had it in place. And other times, you know, if we kind of roll with their, their pre-stacked version, um, it's kind of amusing. <laughs> amusing sounds so mean, but um, because they'll think they've calculated it perfectly, and then all of a sudden they draw a card that they were not expecting. And they're like, wait, 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 and they're trying not to give away the fact that they like had re-stacked the deck in their favor, but they're like, that oh, wasn't supposed to be there. Man, I've got to go back to the beginning. But they're busted every time, either way. Um, and I was thinking about this, and it's, it's interesting because I feel like this is how we relate to the game of life with God a lot of times. I think a lot of times we try to stack the odds in our favor, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but God tends to be always a God of order, and he puts things in a certain order for us, and it kind of gets a little messy when we go in and we try to stack it the way that we think is going to work out for us. Um, and that happens when you are eating off of this diet of fast food faith. I think that we are part of a generation that really likes to dictate exactly how we want it. We're kind of like the Burger King believers um, because we want it We want it our way, right? Our way at BK. Um, we want God to do the things the way that we think they should be done. So we come with this list of prayer requests. We come with our order. And when it doesn't pan out, we think that God's not in it when really we've come with our own agenda. And so if God doesn't show up, if that miracle doesn't manifest in the way that we expected, then we think, well, it wasn't God anyway, or he stamped it with a hard no, but maybe he's already working on it behind the scenes with something that's a little bit more in line with what our dietary needs are in the spirit. So I've been camped out in the book of Isaiah, and I'm going to talk about it for a little bit, but this actually isn't our main text this morning. It's just kind of the inspiration. But a little backstory on Isaiah. Um, it's looking at the Israelite nation, and it's, it's kind of a cool book because it really overlays the entire Bible. You know, it looks at the beginning all the way through salvation, so going from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But the situation here is that the Israelites are in, in exile. They've um, not done a really good job sticking to God's plan. They've kind of reshuffled that deck a little little bit and tried to try to make their own calls and things. And so they're kind of out in the wilderness and they remember that God had made these three major promises to their ancestor, to Abraham. Um, he had pr promised that he was going to make them a great nation, um, that there would be many of them and that the whole world would be blessed because of that um, and that there was going to be this great king to come. But they're, they're very confused about how this is, is looking because there is no promised land at the moment. They're very far from it in Babylon. So they're going, well, I don't see how that's going to work out. Um, their name is definitely not great. There's a lot of them, but there's nothing great about their nation. And even if they had a king, there's no throne for him to be on. Everything has come apart, and so they're highly, highly confused about what God had told them. Have you ever been in a place where you're very confused about what you were very sure that God told you? Yeah. Yeah. And that's where they're at. But God is merciful. Even though they're the ones who set themselves up for a lot of these things, he sends Isaiah to kind of help them through this, to walk them through what's going on, and to, to help with that purification of their lives and their hearts, and to um, set them up to really receive God's blessing. And God does that in our lives, too. Um, a lot of times we think, well, I guess if God didn't answer, it must be a no. But there's so much more that's happening behind the curtain, things that are coming into place for us in order to benefit us. So I want to look this morning um, at Abraham's legacy. So we're going to be hopping kind of high speed through the book of Genesis, but we're going to start out in Genesis 12, uh, verses 1 through 3. And this is where we first see the promises that are made to Abraham. Uh, so verse 1, now the Lord said to Abram, at this point he's called Abram, we'll talk about it later, but God changes his name to Abraham, which is because of a father, so there's your father Abraham song. And if you know it from growing up in church, it's stuck in your head, you're welcome. <laughs> so the Lord said to Abram, <clears throat> 
Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I want to stop here for a second because this is a super cool verse in our family. This is a little known fact, and Michael doesn't even remember this moment all the time, but this is the verse (laughs) that um, really released Michael into church planning. And it was probably three years before God fully released that. Um, But he goes on to say, go to the land that I will show you. And that was very much where we were at at the beginning of our church planning journey. We knew that God had stirred that in his heart. Um, and that he was going to call us, but we had no idea where. But in that moment, he heard a sermon that was preached on this, and it just clicked in his spirit. Now is the time to go. And we had no idea where we were going. We had no idea that we would be in a hotel in Richmond. But God said to go, and so that began our three-year journey. Anyway, sermon's about Abraham, not about us, but cool connection. Uh, Verse 2, And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So note here that the very first thing that God does is he places a call on Abraham's life. Now he blesses him. He he rolls out this whole big blessing plan that's going to, you know, affect all of all of eternity, all of mankind. But it's contingent on Abraham acting. So if he had not answered that call, if he was not willing to go, the rest was null and void. So it's kind of this contract moment, like, I've got all this for you. I want to use you to bless the world, but you need to be willing to step out and believe that I'm going to do what I'm going to tell you I'm about to do. So when we're handed a card in life, we've got a decision to make. First of all, whether it's good, bad, or seemingly indifferent, we need to pray about it. We need to pray and ask God, first of all, is this this from you? But what do you want me to do with it? And sometimes he's going to tell you to go, and he's not going to give you the address. He's just going to say, go. Go here's your card, go with it, and go with God, literally, because you have no idea where he's going to take you. But he's waiting to see, are you going to step out and believe me that I'm going to roll out the promises that I have for you? So contingent upon that, God promises him three things, a great nation, a great name or dynasty, because at this point he doesn't have any kids, he's getting a a bit old to have kids, he thinks, Um, and then a blessing of all people through him and his descendants. And all of these sound really amazing. I mean, who wouldn't love to bless the whole world because you did a good job, right? <laughs> but, um, but if we're not willing to answer that call and step out into the unknown, we can't see these things happen, just like Abraham. Um, so sometimes we struggle with this when, when the picture that we've painted in our mind of things isn't really coming into focus or, you know, we're, we're not getting the diagnosis that we had hoped for or maybe your spouse or your kids are on the run or your finances are in trouble or everything that you have held up in your one tight little prayer request is falling apart. It's not coming together the way that you thought and we lose our confidence in his faithfulness. And so Abraham had this choice. You know, he could receive what God said, even though he didn't know the details, or he could say, that sounds really crazy, God. That's a whole lot of stuff to come to one old man. But he received it, and he stepped out. So Abraham was 70 years old when God had that conversation with him. Um, And at 75, God promised him a son. And during this time, um, and still in a lot of places in the world, it's a very big deal to have a son because you're carrying on the family name um, from generation to generation. And so having a son was everything to, uh, to a father. And so he hadn't had a son at this point, but God said, don't worry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a son. And then from that son, you're going to have a great name in generations to come. So Abraham and his wife, they waited 11 years. That's a long time to wait. Um, if you've ever dealt with infertility or even just waiting for a cure on something, you know that's not a short period of time to wait. So I don't know if you can relate to this. I can relate a little too hard. Abraham's wife decides 11 years is a little bit too long and that maybe, maybe the answer to the prayer request was dependent on her, her acting. You know, that's not crazy. We were just talking about that. So she decides that she's going to step in and help God a little bit. She's going to restack the deck. Anybody else try to restack the deck when things don't seem like they're going? You're like, oh, God must be waiting on me. Duh, why didn't I think of that? Let's, here, God, let me help you out. Let me help you answer and, and make good on your promise. Don't forget. Like, my kids are the best at that. They love to remind us of something that we said, especially Noel. She loves to be like, hey, but you said, even if it's like we're changing what we said, but, but you said. And so sometimes we try to remind God and then steer him in the direction that we want him to go. So um, pretty relatable, at least in my world. So she steps in, and she hires him a baby mama. 
She does. Hopefully that's not personally relatable to you, but that's what she does, okay? So it, <laughs> at 86, he has a son, but it's not the son that God had promised to bless all of, you know, for generations to come. And so they're like, okay, here he is. Let the blessings flow, <laughs> but it's the wrong son. And so God comes back and he says, now, yeah, you have a son, congratulations, but it's the wrong one. This isn't who I meant. So you've got the son Ishmael. Later, they end up having Isaac. And it's interesting because when we put our hand into something that blocks God's blessing, it's going to shift the way things go. He'll still let those blessings flow, but when we interject, when we kind of push his will to one side or the other, it's going to have some consequences. You know, if, if you think of it as like a waterfall and you kind of break through, water's still going to be there. It's still going to flow, but you're disrupting that flow. And we can see consequences of that, those actions today between Ishmael and Isaac. Um, today, we still see all of this um, contention and division in the Middle East because of those those two different sons and, and the division. And that's a whole different message. But that's something that because they thought they, they knew better, it created eternal consequences. Now, God's still faithful, and he continued to bless and, and pour out the blessings that he promised. But there was kind of this you know, footnote here. But if you had waited, that sort of thing. All right, so, um, so they've got this son. They think that's who all the blessings are going to flow through. So imagine their surprise when at, at 99, God shows up to Abraham and says, hey, by the way, that wasn't the son, and you're going to be parents in a year. Congratulations. So at the ripe young age of 100, and Sarah was 90, they have the son that God had intended, that he had promised them. So it took 25 years for them to see God's promise of a son to come to pass. I mean, that's, in our day and age, that's a whole generation. You could have had grandkids at that point, um, but they're getting their first son together. And it, it's easy sometimes to get boxed into this idea that the things that we're praying for, the things that we're waiting on, just have to do with us. You know, God, I, I need you to help me with the situation. I need you to heal this person. I'd really love to have a son or a child or that job. And we get tunnel vision on what our, our need or our request is. And we miss that God isn't just working things together for our good. Scripture says that he's working things together for all who are called according to his will. And so his will may not be just about your initial request. So while you're getting impatient or you're trying to restack your deck, you need to understand God is working on more than just your simple request. It's so much bigger than that. So something that God does is he takes these prayers and he creates a platform on the shoulders of other believers, okay? So as you put out these uh, these prayers of faith, it's not just to get an answer there, but to create a platform for the next generation to stand on, for their prayers to build another platform until we can reach what God has for us. Just like we talked about with our mission last week, you know, we exist so that we can help others rise above where they are to where God made them to be. And some of that comes in the form of our prayers. When we are praying great prayers of faith, we might not be seeing the answer to that in the way that we think, but we're creating that platform for others to keep rising up. And so the miracles that we're praying for are often foundational to God's move in other generations. And so I want to look at that in, through the lens of Abraham. Um, so God moves these from promises into covenants, and that's a, that's a much bigger deal. You know, I, Michael, when we were dating, he gave me a promise ring, okay? It wasn't an engagement ring, but it was a promise ring saying, hey, I'm really serious. We're a little young to get engaged, but this is my intention. This is going to be replaced with this someday. And so I want to promise you that this is the direction that we're going. And so God gave that, that promise ring, if you will, and this is, the, this is the engagement. This is the covenant that I'm, I'm promising that I'm going to do this. So we're going to look at Genesis 15, 13 through 18. And this goes back to the promise of land and the nation. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not yours and will be servants there, and they'll be afflicted for 400 years. That's a long time. Like God first said, Hey, I promise that you're going to have all this land. And he's like, But hold on, your family's going to hang out for 400 years because they're going to be bad. And I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterward, they'll come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go back to your fathers in peace. You should be buried in a good old age. And they'll come back here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. 
Um, On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. So God is, is generous here because a lot of times he doesn't tell us what's coming down the pike. You know, he asks us to step out, and it is into that unknown. It is into that, that place that we're not sure where he's taking us. But he says, Abraham, look, this is not, this is not an overnight blessing. This is not something we're going to microwave here. This is going to take a while, okay? This is more of a Thanksgiving dinner than a lean cuisine turkey thing, and we're done, okay? And so here's what's going to happen. You're going to be faithful to me. You're going to keep your end of the bargain. But your, your kids and their kids and their kids, well, they're going to be a little, a little bit more rascally than you. So they're going to get into some trouble, but don't worry. I've already made, I've made you know, plans for that. So in the end, they're going to come back. I'm going to bring them back. So I want you to rest in peace knowing that you're going to live a good life. You're going to die in peace, and you're going to know that I'm going to fulfill this. And that's so cool that he does that. Um, And it speaks to his relationship with Abraham, and Abraham is honoring him. Uh, One of the great things that Abraham is known for is his willingness to give up his son um, as a sacrifice, and God stops that. But I think that's, that's part of where this favor comes in, is that God understands and sees that Abraham is willing to honor him and to give up even the things that God has promised him, if that's, if that's what God wants. So God fulfills his promise generations down the line. Um, it's about 430 years, I think, from the time that he made this promise to Abraham to the time that they actually reached the, the promised land. But he fulfilled it through other people. And so when we talk about creating these platforms of, of faith, these foundations for people to rise up on, Moses had the opportunity to lead the Israelites out of, out of Egypt, and then Joshua ends up leading them back into the promised land. And so it's this beautiful family thing that takes years to accomplish, but God is faithful in it, and he draws them back into the promised land. All right, Genesis 17, 6 through 7. And this is where he becomes Father Abraham. All right, he's, he promises to uh, give him a great name, basically like a dynasty. And it says, I'll make you exceedingly fruitful, and I'll make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. So, again, this is the point where Abram becomes Father Abraham and we all sing along. Um, and so God fulfills, I'm not going to do that to you. It's, it's been in my head for like two days. God fulfills uh, this covenant. <laughs> Michael's laughing because he like wants to come up and do the dance. I should have done that to him. <laughs> if you don't know it, just see him afterward. I'm not dancing for you. Um, God, God fulfills this covenant um, through the Davidic line. All right, so King David ultimately becomes the bloodline through which Jesus is born. So if you really look way down the line, this whole plan comes to fruition over a thousand years later. Um, but the offspring um, that he promises uh, come through this, through this line. So he uses David's line to bless the whole world with salvation, and that comes into the picture in Genesis 22, uh, 17 through 18. I will, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that's in the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. This is fulfilled through that new covenant. So we've got the Mosaic covenant where they get back to the promised land. You've got the Davidic covenant. I know these are like, whoa, big words. But um, the Davidic covenant, and that's where the bloodline ends up leading to Jesus. So you've got your kings there. And then you have the new covenant that's made years later through Jesus. And so when you look at this, this began, this whole process that unfolded was God making promises to one man just one man, that if he was faithful and if he pursued God, there would be blessings to come for generations and ultimately for all mankind. And it started with just a simple step of faithfulness. So I want to encourage you that the most seemingly small or insignificant prayer has more power than you can ever imagine. You can set into motion a chain reaction of eternal significance if you will just be faithful to pray for the things that God has stirred in your spirit. And just because you haven't seen Jesus move in your life doesn't mean he hasn't shown up. It just means that his hand is somewhere that you can't see. It might be under the table doing some work. You haven't seen his hand in it, but that doesn't mean that he hasn't already answered. And so the thing that, the thing is that God has promised you, the thing that you've been praying for, don't give up on that. 
God has put that in your heart for a reason, and he's working it together. You know, one of my kids, <laughs> going back to this whole idea of Candyland, um, one of my kids, who I won't call out, frequently decides that they're just going to bail out of the game. They get bored, or it's not going in their, in their favor, and so they're just like, oh, I'm going to go see what Daddy's doing, or I'm going to go do this. And then they try to return to the game later, and I have to hold the line and say, no, you've got to wait to the next round. But, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, we do that a lot, too. A lot of times, things are not going the way that we think. Um, we've been praying and praying and praying for something. We've been believing and believing, and we start to feel kind of foolish. Maybe that wasn't really God. Maybe that was, maybe I was just making it up. Maybe God doesn't care. Maybe, maybe it's just not going to happen. But here's the thing. God is not your Santa Claus in the sky. He's not just going to drop presents into your lap when you ask for, for certain things. Yes, we should take all things to him, and he's always going to answer. But just because it's on your wish list doesn't mean it's going to come packaged the way that you think. It could be that he's leaving an entire Christmas tree worth of gifts for generations to come. But you just have to make that first ask and keep being faithful in asking for it. You know, Abraham, he received his call at 70. Don't think that it's too late or that you've been praying too long for something. But at 70 years old, he was willing to step into what he was called to. One of the um, pastoral team members from our old church is, how old is he? Mark's father. Okay, okay well, anyway. <laughs> Somebody, on, um, I know a really sweet old man who is about to go he's like in his 80s I think um, he's about to go into the mission field um, by himself across the world um, and I do I think he's in his 80s and he's just going to move to this tiny town and he doesn't know a single person because he went and visited and God said I want you to come here and he's like wait what you know he was praying in a cafe in this Muslim town where there's not a single Christian and God said my heart's breaking and you're the answer and so he's going to go He's just going to up and go. So if you think that you have been praying on something too long or that it's too late in the game, it's not. Keep going. At 75, he got promised a son. That was crazy. And he was 100 when he finally met his son. It is not too late for your prayer request. And it was 430 years until his generation got back into the promised land. Now, if that doesn't do something for your prayer life, I'm not sure what will. That's either a really, really defeating thought, like, holy smokes, I've got I've to pray for half a century for that to happen. Or that's something to get you fired up. That if you have the faith to believe, God is going to take your prayer request beyond today. He's going to take it to the next generation and the next generation. And we can get pumped about that, guys, because there is more power and prowess in your prayers than you can ever imagine. So when we pray, let's not just do, well, you might like to do these cutesy prayers. You know, God is good. God is great. Let us thank him for our food. But if you're going to pray that way, let's do it with some purpose, okay? If you're going to ask him to bless your food, which you should, don't just make it so you don't get food poisoning, but let him nourish your body so that you can be strong, so that you can go out and fight for the kingdom because he's called you to a spiritual battle. So let's make it something more than just a routine. We want to have purpose behind the prayers. God's equipped you to fight for great things that you might not even know about if you are willing to step out. And he stacked the cards in your favor. Even if you see some wild cards come up that seem like a setback you'll never recover from, God's got it stacked in your favor. He is not playing the short game. Turn to your neighbor and say, God's playing the long game. Are you in it for the long game? Yeah, God's in it for the long game. And he's faithful, not just today, not just tomorrow, but for all generations to come, for all who will seek him and serve him. Let's go ahead and pray. God, we just thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, that you are faithful through the ages, Father. God, that even when we don't see it, you are working. God, that you have not left us, you have not forgotten us, Lord, but you are faithful to complete the things that you have promised. And so, God, I just pray this morning for myself and my friends, Lord, that you would make us faithful servants. God, that whether we see the answer to our prayers or not, God, that we can trust to release those to you for generations to come, God. Would you use us as vessels of your peace and of your purpose, God, and would you move mightily through this church and through your big C church, God, that you would be glorified. And it's in your name we pray.